Yes, um, so my background is actually from the private equity and venture capital space. I worked as a business consultant before, so I always had like an affinity to um, alternative assets. I also did a chartered alternative investment analyst. So my passion for alternative assets was always there. And of course, what is the most alternative asset is probably I would say the crypto space and ICOs, right? So um, yes, I was very passionate about that and that's actually why we decided to um, launch this ICO accelerator because we thought there are like too many scams out there um, and a lot of other issues I will discuss with you later. And actually, yes, I want to talk about um, the early stage investment process today as it is in the venture capital space and um, want to compare it to the ICO space. I think that's what I'm first going to do. So actually, I think it's always important to understand the venture capital space, the early stage investment process, to understand what is actually the role of tokens and ICOs. So actually what normally happens, you as an investor, if you are rich enough, normally you have to invest like at least $100,000, uh, for example, so only for, I would say, pretty wealthy people. Um, you contribute that to a VC fund and the VC management actually manages the fund. The fund uh, funds, um, the fund funds, yeah, the VC fund funds startups and they are aiming to make an exit. That could be an IPO, that could be a merger or an acquisition. And then um, they would get returns on the exit to the VC fund and then actually you would get some distribution back and the VC management would actually receive the management fee and the carry, so the incentive fee. That's normally 2% and 20% incentive fee. Um, so it's quite a good, I'm, n I'm not against it, it's a good system, it's necessary that it's there, um, but it has some problems. For example, at least um, you will be, no, I will start in the beginning. So um, they are gatekeepers, venture capitalists, so they, a lot of good startups out there, a lot of good startups I've seen, I know personally, got unfunded. So they got no funding for really, really good ideas because there's the VC management and they decide what startups actually get funded. And I think that's something maybe the crowd should decide if they have enough information available to make a good decision. Secondly, um, investors have little to no choice over the investment. So you have a limited partner partnership agreement with the funds, but actually you cannot decide what startups they will in the end really invest in. They will always choose. And in the ICO space, of course, you can choose. Um, no liquidity. So even if you are rich enough and you have $100,000, to invest in, in, invest in it, it will be a way for the next seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. And so there's no secondary market and I think that's a big um, issue in the, at the moment. Um, then as I mentioned, the, the fees um, and then very subjective valuations. I mean, it's actually the same at the moment in the token world. So you're relying on people who are yeah, using methods, if it's a discounted cash flow method or um, um, other methods, but it's always very subjective and it's not like really you can't really, it's not 100% reliable. That's what I want to say here. Um, and the process, I think that's a very important point for an entrepreneur, can take very, very long. So up to nine months, I think you, if you found a company, what you want to do? You want to start business development, you want to build a product and you want to be passionate about that, what you are doing at the moment and focus on the important stuff. But now then you are negotiating with a VC for nine months because they want to have certain veto power, they want to have uh, some control, um, they want to decide in what strategic di uh, direction you will go and stuff like that. So actually that now cha um, is changing in the early stage investment process. And that's a really, really good thing about tokens and ICOs. So what um, actually investors have, now they can really choose what startups to invest in. Secondly, um, there's a liquid market, a secondary market. So as soon as you have tokens, as soon as you have shares, you can really sell them on the secondary market whenever you need liquidity. And there's no, like no minimal amount you have to invest in normally. So even with one euro, with five euro, whatever you have at the moment, you can just buy in and you can sell it anytime you want. And I think that's a great advantage here. Um, benefit for the startups themselves, it's quick and easy fundraising. As I mentioned before, you can focus on business development. I think that's absolutely um, brilliant. Um, and you, you maintain control of the company's strategy. I think you as an entrepreneur, you should always determine what direction to go. What is the right direction? Because you had this idea, you had this vision, and actually other people should support you with cash, yes, but they should not determine what direction to go. They could help you, they could advise you. I think that's good. That's part of the decentralized world as well, but they shouldn't control it. So um, yes, it's a very um, traditional picture here, the J curve on the left, that's actually how it used to be. Yeah? So how it used to be is actually you're a lonely entrepreneur running, then you find maybe an angel investor who would give you some money. You would find maybe seed capital in a seed fund, 
Um, afterwards, you would uh, go for an early stage investment, Series A, Series B. Afterwards, expansion, so growth capital, for example. Then maybe mezzanine later, and then finally, in the end, if you're big enough, you crew enough, an IPO. So um, seven stages, and even more sometimes. Um, the new world is actually, you're an entrepreneur, you get seed capital, you need to develop an MVP. And as soon as you have an MVP and the people know it's working and they have a good feeling about it, you can go for an ICO, you d determine how much money you need, and then you can build your whole company. So what is an initial coin offering? I think that's, yeah, at the moment, like, <laughs> even like three, four, five months back, I had to explain it to everyone. I think now it's not that necessary anymore. But in general, it's a fundraising mechanism. Now I compared it to venture capital because it's early stage investing, but actually it's much more similar to an IPO. So an IPO is when a company decides to issue shares. It's much more similar to there because you have a secondary market. But what is the problem about an IPO? It takes really, really long and you have to fulfill a lot of regulation to do an IPO. So that's not an option for a startup. That's why actually ICOs are there. And then you issue a cryptocurrency or a token, basically. I will afterwards come to the different kind of tokens that exist. So um, you can definitely define that differently if you want. That's at least the definition we have at Iconic Lab and what the German Blockchain Association is proposing. So on the very left you have like cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, they are native to the protocol and they are running. And then on the very right side, I want to just do the opposite, are the asset tokens, so the securities. So it really is like yeah, the same as an equity or a debt instrument. You could put a bond or any equity investment actually on the blockchain and on a token via smart contract is possible. In between, you have something like access tokens. That's, for example, what we are doing. So you get an access to a certain service that you wouldn't get without a token, for example. And then you have hybrid, of course. So you can combine everything. So actually, you can really start now financial engineering again because the traditional financial markets, they reach their limit. There is like no space for creativity anymore. But I think in this token world, you can really be very, very creative and really try to find new instruments that maybe have the perfect sense for a specific business model. Yeah, token sales are really gaining traction. I think all of you are aware of that. I think that's one slide which shows it very, very well. And it's even not uh, updated as of today, otherwise we would be at 370 million billion here, I think. So yeah, number of ICO projects in the last year, uh, fivefold. So we already have seen 230 ICOs this year. Um, money raised last year in 2016, it was 96 million euro. If you imagine like the big ICO this year, they already, Tezos, uh, already raised like uh, three times this amount, yeah? What doesn't mean that Tezos is good, but um, it's just a number. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, this year already 3.6 billion euro were raised, so it actually a uh, 37 fold. So you can see how these markets are actually gaining traction. It is an instrument for the future, definitely, and it, I think it makes the world better. It's, it's a really, really innovative fund raising mechanism. It's just misused by a lot of people. That's the problem here. And you see, especially blockchain projects, in the meantime, 60% of the blockchain projects get funded through a token. And that's a big problem, for example, for VCs, because they want to get exposure to blockchain technology, because it's a great technology. Everyone agrees blockchain will come, blockchain will make the world better. But at the same time, they can now fund through an ICO, so they are not open to an equity investment anymore. And that's, I think, a big issue you're already also seeing at the moment. And then, of course, the crypto market cap went up from 14 billion to 300 billion. Today, I think 360 billion. IOTA and Bitcoin are really pushing it up. So, yeah, I told you now how great this world is, how great ICOs are in general for entrepreneurs, but that's not the truth. Uh, that's not the truth. There are a lot of issues, as always, in like um, early times of such technologies and such innovations. At first, pre-seed funding. Um, a, lot of pe a lot of projects go out and they don't have an MVP. They don't have a prototype, they just write a fancy white paper and say, okay, what words do I actually have to put in that uh, people will buy in? Normally you will then find blockchain, protocol, AI, big data, and then combine it somehow, I don't know, maybe they're shaking it, yeah, and then some fancy buzzwords come out and then they hope that people will invest. 
But actually, that's yeah, that's how it is. I, I mean, it's changing at the moment because people are getting more critical towards that, and that's good. But definitely, pre-seed funding in the stage is needed, and that's why still VCs, for example, are needed because someone has to give them the first money, like the first 100k, 200k ICOs are expensive in the meantime. So I think there's still um, space for both financing mechanisms, definitely. As scams and fraud, I think um, yeah, I already mentioned uh, Tezos here, so. Um, no, 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 sorry, not in the scam. I would, I would rather uh, put them here on five over liquidated projects. No, it's not scam. Um, scams and fraud. So yeah, you have seen, I think all of you are aware of the example where a college student who wanted to finance his university program just uh, did some, yeah, I would call it a bullshit bingo. So just some words um, that sound fancy, put it into a white paper and then raised money, paid his study fees. And then, yeah, there was of course no product. Yeah, it was just a lie. Yeah, and uh, stuff like that is actually happening. So be very, very careful with the white papers. Then legal framework. It's very, very hard for startups to choose the, uh, the right jurisdiction because every day you see new news released from every jurisdiction, from Germany, from Italy, from Gibraltar, from Scandinavia, from Estonia, everywhere in the world, what, how they are actually treating ICOs. And dependent, you as an investor are actually really dependent on where they set this vehicle up. Because in the end, you could be the one who's losing his money because they didn't do a proper legal check beforehand. And that's a big problem here. Then unaudited token contracts. So if the smart contracts, they should always be audited by a third party. I think that's absolutely essential because you have seen the cases where money was stolen just because there was a mistake in the smart contract. Or in other cases, the just some uh, someone hacked into the system, released another um, Ethereum address, and then the money went somewhere. Yeah, that's uh, also a big problem here. So unaudited token contracts and also cyber security are very, very important points here. Then over liquidated projects. Yeah, um, so I think there's no sense in raising it. I don't know, maybe if you want to change the whole world and everything, maybe you can raise 200 million. I don't know. But normally, uh, really like sustainable business models, they could aim for, I don't know, 2 million, 3 million, 4, 5, maybe 6 million, maybe in really Extraordinary cases, maybe 10 or 20 million if it's necessary, but there's no need to, uh, to raise really 300 million euro. And um, that's definitely something we are hopefully seeing in the near, uh, in the near future, that um, they will start to raise responsible amounts. And then lack of transparency. So you put the money into an ICO and you have no clue where it's going. It's actually like a black hole. You really have like no clue what they are doing with it. We, for example, we work together with uh, Zentiment. I don't know if you heard of them. Uh, Zentiment is actually like the Bloomberg of the cryptocurrency space. They will phrase themselves and we are working on a post ICO reporting tool where actually all the amounts that are spent within the crypto space would be tracked by a wallet tracker. It works on NEO, it works on Ethereum. So actually the, the two most important blockchains in that part. And that way you are able to see what is actually happening and if you then combine it with real world accounting, you can really do like an accounting tool which actually combines the ICO world with the real finance world and you are able to see what is your money that you invested actually spent for. So how are we envisioning the future ICO landscape actually? We are seeing definitely more regulation. A lot of people are yeah, very worried about this. Um, I like it to be honest because I don't think it should be treated as the traditional financial market completely because it is a different mindset, it is, is a different market. And, but regulation is good because it will protect the investors at the end of the day. It will, and it will protect, yeah, it will throw away the scammers, hopefully. And what do I mean with regulation? For example, KYC, know your customer, um, that we don't uh, support money laundering or something like that with ICOs. And I think we will see much more quality projects because you're always uh, already seeing there were like, I think the peak of ICOs was maybe in June, May, I would say July. Um, and actually it already declined a little bit because a lot of ICOs found out they have to pay so much for an ICO for marketing. They're paying 1 million marketing budget. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and they will, they will not, and, but they can't raise as much money anymore as like um, half a year ago, for example. And that's why I think that the big quality projects with high quality, they will survive because people will now know if a, quality, if a project has a high quality and this one will still get funding, I'm sure. And in the end, decentralized wealth because what it does, ICOs, it's breaking down geographical barriers. It doesn't matter in what country you are. It doesn't matter 
who you are and it doesn't matter who your team is, um, you can raise money everywhere. It's breaking down geographical barriers and any other barriers we are knowing that. I think that's a world where we all want to live in, definitely. So it really empowers entrepreneurs from other countries. And I think that's a great way to distribute wealth um, through the world. Um, as, yeah, small, what industries are actually getting disrupted at the moment? I think that's also quite an interesting use case. So, I mean, actually this list could be much, much bigger, but um, I think that, uh, like, uh, for example, real estate. I don't know if you have heard of Raidao, for example, in Malaysia. So tokenized real estate. That's um, very, very interesting. We are also working with a startup here together in Germany who wants to tokenize um, real assets and also um, ship financing assets. So a few very interesting things. Then, of course, payments. Everyone is aware that Amazon, um, Zalando is already uh, accepting Bitcoin and Amazon, I think, announced that they will as well. Um, so payment, of course, everyone is aware of. Healthcare, also a nice example um, of the blockchain technology that uh, users can get incentivized to share their health-related data with researchers. Because we have a lot of diseases that we can't um, control at the moment, but we could control them if we would have enough data from people. And I think if people would be incentivized to share that data with research institutions, not with insurances and banks and people who want to monetize it, but really with research institutions, we could make the world better there because we would have more information about diseases. Um, insurances, um, we're also working with a startup together there. Um, for much less money in developing countries, you could really protect yourself. You could get insurances, I don't know in what countries, and really for $30 a year, you would get like cancer uh, protection coverage up to $30,000. That's possible now. And that's a, also a really, really cool thing, in my opinion. Utilities industry, um, I think it has been in the press, so that actually um, also the devices are talking to each other, they are paying each other and stuff like that. Then betting, trading, voting, banking, music, humanitarian, I think is a very, very big space. What I, for example, like, I was never a big fan of Western Union, for example, because Western Union people go into other countries where they earn more money, hopefully, and then they send money back to the families. And just for giving the money here and to the counter, and then on the, other, on the other side of the world, someone is getting it from the counter, they receive like 10% fee or 8% fee. That's absolutely not fair. And through the blockchain, if you send it, then it's actually just someone there needs a wallet, you need a wallet here, and you can transfer with 1% transaction costs. I think that's also something what um, is making the world better as well. And I think it's not only about startups, what we are doing, what we are tokenizing. It's not all about ICOs. I think you could also think about tokenized enterprises in general. And actually, this was a really, really good article. I can recommend everyone from uh, BigchainDB, um, who's hosting that as well. Um, so actually, a company like Facebook, for example, they could really tokenize themselves. Like, um, we are living in a shareholder determined world. So actually, who gives money to your firm receives all the benefits, but who contributes doesn't get like all the benefits and that could change. So for example, half, um, you could now do some kind of an ICO and like all of the shares would be actually 50% of the tokens and the other 50% of the tokens are reserved for everyone who's actually contributing some, something to the system. I mean, the guy who spoke before me, he's so smart, I'm sure he can code something on Facebook, yes, and then he would maybe receive uh, 10,000 tokens for, ease, for it. Um, if I do a post which is like shared and liked by 100 uh, people, I would maybe get 20 tokens. So everyone who's making the ecosystem, the platform better, will, uh, will also get um, a piece of the cake, so a piece of the value appreciation. And I think that's also a very great thing. So not only the people who give money to it, but also the people who just make the product better. And I think that's how the world um, should work in this space. And I'm really, really yeah, curious how this will look like, like in five or six years, because I think it's just the beginning time of tokenization at the moment. Oh. Who are we? We are Iconic Lab, um, a token acceleration program. Um, yeah, I think I already told you why I was so passionate about it and why we founded it. Uh, we are currently, we are founded in Berlin. Currently, we are uh, headquartered in Frankfurt and our acceleration program will take place in uh, Berlin. Um, so actually what we are doing, we are um, try or startups from all over the globe are currently applying to us. At the moment we have like 120 applications. We will choose the five or six best ones of those blockchain and crypto startups and will accelerate them to an ICO. The first batch starts in February, then we have like a three-month program. I will come to that later. 
um, to really to bring the best and most sustainable token business solutions to the investors because clearly there's like no due diligence at the moment in the market and that's what we want to bring in there. Um, yeah, I think I already told you the source and fund the top startups, projects and teams. So of course the teams in the background are also very, very important part of the due dig diligence process, of course. Accelerate the teams to a token launch. They are so thankful because the, the projects we are working with currently, they are so th thankful because they can really focus on business development. They don't have to negotiate with funds, with like other interest groups. They can really build their product and we are actually doing more or less th the other stuff for them and organizing it. Um, and transparency for the crypto market. So as I told you, we are working on a post ICO reporting tool that we will always provide you the documents from our due diligence that you know what actually was our due diligence, what did we do and how did we score the company? And how did this company actually uh, come to the accelerator? Why was it so good? Yeah, it's about community, transparency and quality. I think I already mentioned that more or less, so quality, especially because we are really focusing on due diligence here. And the next slide, it's very ugly, um, I have to admit, um, because there's a lot of text, you can read everything, but I just want to give you a feeling what the due diligence process actually needs. It's not what other people here in the crypto industry actually are saying it is. It's not about like, okay, doing a little bit background check, or do they have competitors? Hmm? Yeah, sounds fancy, cool, we do it. It's really, it's about, it's about meeting them, receiving all the legal documentation, um, doing financial review, do they already have customers, do they have revenues? Meet them in person, get a feeling for what the kind of people are, what have they done before? Did they fail, did they succeed? Um, I think that are all things that are included here. And then finally also, is this a business? Because we are even denying businesses who are good businesses, but are not a fit for a good token model. That could be the case. So is, even if it's a good business, does it also have an applicable token model? Is that actually possible here? And also a liquidity review. So we will not go, if the startup, for example, in the beginning would say, yeah, we are aiming for one startup we had <laughs> actually, who said like, we want to raise 200 million euro, yeah? We said, yeah, no, sorry, <laughs> you don't uh, need it, yeah? Uh, we are not working together. Uh, anyways, um, good luck to them if they want to raise 200 million euro and uh, we are doing a liquidity review. So what does it mean? That we really determine what money will they need to um, come to the next milestone to become a sustainable business. And, and in the end, they should be sustainable after two, three, four years when the money is spent, they should become sustainable so they that they can finance themselves. And it's a very community driven acceleration program. So um, startups apply to us, we are doing the due diligence, we are giving our service package. So it's, um, we are talking to crypto investors to really build the best token model pr uh, possible, where also crypto hedge funds would say that's something I would definitely invest in. We are giving them legal help, so we are not giving legal advice, of course, because we are not lawyers, but we know like all the legal teams in Gibraltar, in Singapore, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Italy, and so on, and we can connect them there. That's also good for the investors because you want to have a company that is really domiciled somewhere where this idea and token model is also uh, feasible. And then actually there comes the exclusive pre-sale, so actually to participate in our startups, you have to hold our token. Um, what does this mean? So if you hold 1% of our token, you would be allowed to invest on a pro rata, is the um, term, base in the startup. So if you hold 1% of us, you can invest into 1% of each startup's tokens. But normally it would be never the case that 100% would say, yes, I invest in every startup. So actually after this, every token holder of us would be allowed to invest unlimited into the startups. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, it will actually never even get to a public ICO because this four, five, six, seven million euro should be funded through our network and token holders. And of course, um, yeah, you are the only one then who would have this discount. And then of course, um, providing also I help in the ICO with marketing, developing the white paper, color paper and stuff like that. So typical accelerator um, tasks. I think, yeah, that's, um, What's the time actually? 8.35. Okay, still works. Okay, good. So yeah, what happens actually if you apply as a startup to us, um, we would first have um, two weeks presence in Berlin. 
So you would be in Berlin and then actually we have like a great mentor network. So experts out of all kind of industries and you as a startup would always choose one expert from the business development side. So who's really an expert in your industry who could give you advice. Then one crypto investor who can always tell you your token is good. Maybe we should change it. Maybe we should iterate. And then the third one, which is actually coming from the blockchain and tech side, because I think that's yeah also the mo to have a third party view on your protocol or your smart contracts or whatever you're doing with the blockchain, I think is absolutely essential here. And then you have the pre-sales, as I said, so we are really working to develop the best possible color and white papers to present it to all of our token holders and all the interested investors. And there will be like one day where all the investors fly in to Berlin and actually you will pitch to them and um, you can um, chat with them. And in the whole process, actually you as a token holder can uh, always provide feedback to the startups. Is this the way the token actually should be structured? Is this really what, did you ever think about adding maybe this to your business model? So it's also very community driven. I think we are living in a decentralized world where um, actually any, anyone should um, yeah, have some, add some benefits to ideas like that, yeah, especially when he's like also invested into it. And then of course the post-ICO reporting again. So all of our startups have to use the post-ICO reporting as well as we do. And yes, they will also be part of the project transparency. Have you heard of it? Project transparency, it's like a sentiment and I think 18 other crypto companies, including us. It was like a total market cap, I think together of 800 billion, agreed that every expenditure of more than 0.1% of the tokens raised will be definitely always released. And uh, all of our startups will of course also join this project. Yeah. And I think, yeah, a uh, strength of us is definitely also our crypto network. I talked about the seed funding. So in the beginning, they, re uh, they receive seed funding, uh, business development, all the experts I've mentioned, and of course, legal help, because it's really it's changing every day. I don't know how much you followed it. It's really ch steadily changing. And here's some uh, pipeline findings, actually, from our application. I think that's always quite interesting, because, um, yeah, what I was talking now was more theoretical, more about like financial stuff and so on. But actually that, that is who's applying to us. So you can see uh, by industries, it's very, very diverse. So you can see that a lot of industries are actually affected by the blockchain. It's getting a lot of um, attention. And yes, they are applying to us. And that is wh where they come from. So still a lot of people from West Germany, especially uh, West Germany. Uh, <laughs> why is no one correcting me? Uh, <laughs> uh, from Western Europe. From Western Europe, so especially like, we have a lot of uh, applications from uh, Germany, from uh, France, from uh, Engl England, actually one, one of the most, and uh, Spain as well. Uh, but you see actually um, every continent, every, every area of the world, we already received applications. And that's, I think, very interesting because I think one of the biggest issues, as I mentioned, is actually that startups are raising t too much money. Yeah, they are issuing too many tokens, they are raising too much money. But that's actually what we found out with our startups that we were like in the due diligence phase when we talked about what funds do they actually want or need. This was like um, what they uh, initially said. So you can see that clearly most of them are in the range between 1 and 10 million euro. And I think that's perfectly, um, yeah, that's absolutely responsible and it can be the case to cover your next year's costs, your expansion and stuff like that. It's totally fine. That's money you definitely need. And I want to give you some other examples. Yeah. What is the concept of too much money? I, I don't know this concept. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what oh. do you mean by they raise too much money? Um, because, for example, a billion is better than a million, right? Pardon? A billion is better than a million. No, but you can never provide the value back to the token holders. Imagine you're raising 260 million euro. The problem is you're not making your platform four times as good as if you would raise, oh, mathematics, uh, 65 million euro. You wouldn't do it four times as good. But, but the size of the customers, you will. And that's everything that counts, right? Yeah, but why should you give someone 260 million euro if he doesn't need it? He doesn't need it? Yes. Yes. Uh, if you can, if you can basically achieve such a high market cap on an exchange, and you raise more, you you have to capture more for the team. But maybe you don't want that. I mean, 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, ha half of the money raised always goes to the team, and I don't see the need why an ICO of 200 million euro, why 50 million euros should get uh, go to the founders. They get rich, and then they are not even incentivized to work anymore on the project. So ma maybe maybe a little bit for later. Um, but actually, for me, actually. The Yeah. Half, and you can see it's three times now. It has two class actions in SEC. Uh, he has Tezos, who's also been sued. Yeah. Uh, you, you get sued because your track record, when you release a new white paper, has to be followed to, to a T. Otherwise, you're committing fraud. If you, commit, if you raise so much money that you don't follow that and try to pivot, you're committing fraud. Mm -hmm. And if you raise that much money, you can't repay the value to the investors, so they're incentivized to sue you for fraud. Yeah. They actually have damages. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and on the other hand, uh, when it's about market cap and so on, I mean, just follow, for example, the ICOs of uh, Sentiment or Token as a Service. They didn't, they didn't uh, raise too much money in the beginning, but now they are, they are raising in market cap farther and farther because it is very demanded. It doesn't mean that if you raise one t 10 million euro, that doesn't have to be the end. Yes, the market cap could go up, of course. But I think if you're a good business, then this will happen automatically. I think that's my comment here. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk uh, very quick about um, some of the startups in our pipeline, which I think are very, very interesting. That's, for example, Topple. Uh, they did research about transaction costs and what are actually the barriers not to invest into developing countries. So they are working together, especially with uh, South American countries and with African countries, because um, you have two problems actually in that space. Um, it's on the one hand, um, it's the corruption. So um, you don't know what the money is spent for, actually. You don't know if it's totally received there. You don't know who were like the intermediaries. Of course, um, that's um, changed by the blockchain. And um, the second part are the transaction costs. If you want to invest into a startup um, in a developing country, you're facing much more transaction costs, actually, as if you would invest in a startup in Germany. And uh, that's another um, issue that actually the blockchain is solving because, yeah, for the protocol, it doesn't matter where the money goes to. Um, it would be the same transaction cost. Um, yeah, they are from Houston. I have a great uh, background as well. And I really uh, like the project. Then this is very, um, very straightforward. This is uh, one of our consulting uh, projects, actually, so not an accelerator candidate. Also very, very interesting because uh, stock photos at the moment, the problem is that the platforms actually take 50 to 90 to 90 percent of commissions. I mean, I didn't know that before, but uh, it's true. <laughs> uh, so really, and the artists, uh, are, uh, on the other hand, of this, um, of this value chain are actually the ones who are not earning the money they deserve. You as a user, you pay too much, and the artists are not earning too much, but the intermediary is happy. So actually, yeah, the perfect use case actually for a blockchain protocol, absolutely, to uh, buy stock photos. And yes, it's um, they are in Cologne in uh, Germany, also very nice use case, I like it a lot. Then health base, I think I talked a little bit about health before, but um, yes, so actually what they are trying to do, we are also consulting here, um, is that, yeah, I think I already mentioned like all the research aspects, but also that for example doctors could access your data because normally you have like five or six different kind of doctors. I, I'm lucky I don't have that many doctors, but uh, some people have. And what definitely I think nowadays is pretty clear that for example psychology and like uh, physical factors that they um, play together, that there is a clear relationship and an interdependence between those two factors. But normally those two would go uh, independently, separa separately. But if you would do it on the blockchain, it would actually make the data aggregated and accessible. They could even work together to find out what's really wrong with you. And um, also the research institutes would actually be uh, much, much more able to give good solutions and uh, good research to you. And that's Cryptonaut, that's a little bit more a funny thing, I really like it, because actually it's a trading game. That are the guys who, uh, the guys, the, the guys who uh, founded Uptick, so it, was one of the it is one of the biggest uh, trading games in the traditional financial markets. And actually they are now aiming to do more or less the same with the crypto. So actually you would invest in cryptos, you have a, a certain strategy, I have a certain strategy, we are playing against each other, so we have like competitions, and if I am playing better than you, then I will receive tokens. And if not, if you're worse, you would not receive tokens. And actually with these tokens, you would even... So all the they, they are gathering all the data. So they are creating AI out of the best traders. And this AI actually will manage an automated um, an AI hedge fund, which is investable then for real investors. 
And with the tokens you're receiving, if you make that algorithm better, could actually be used to pay the management fees of the fund. So you don't fa pay um, any fees if you want to invest into the fund. That's actually also uh, quite creative and I really like it. And I have a great track record as well. That's um, about our token. I think uh, everything said more or less. So project sourcing, you can, um, you can always provide feedback to the um, projects we are sourcing, to the token models and uh, stuff like that. And, also, and of course the exclusive pre-sales. So you will be the only one who can participate in the pre-sale, but I don't want to advertise for us here too much. Um, and that are the stakeholders we're actually bringing together. So of course the startups, the ICNQ token holders, the crypto traders themselves. We are working with a lot of crypto traders together. The mentor network, so all the experts which are uh, making the businesses better and of course our strategic partners. Yeah, that's us, very multinational, US, Latvia, Germany, India and uh, Poland. And yes, all with uh, really good careers already. Three in the financial space. Um, Arabda did uh, marketing actually in Spain for uh, startups there, also really good. And this is like our advisors at the moment. You, so you can see from the, I mean, we are always trying to bridge actually the traditional financial world with the crypto um, world. And you can see that here. Uh, so we have like a regular accelerator here, for example. We have a blockchain um, expert from the blockchain center, but we also have like David Drake as an investment advisor or Mitchell Laurier, uh, Loriero who did, did like the marketing campaigns for Steemit and for uh, Sentiment. And yeah, that are our strategic partners. I think it makes sense. So some investors, some research institutions, the German blockchain association where we are working with to really make Germany and especially Berlin really maybe the, cup, uh, the capital in Europe for crypto and for blockchain. I think that's what we should really aim for. It's a chance for us to really become that capital. And uh, yeah, I think um, that's it here. Thank you. But I'm yeah, happy to answer questions. <laughs> So, any questions? Yes. Um, particularly interested in the section that you presented regarding the types of those tokens. Yes. Mm -hmm. on yes. On the one hand, you showed that you can issue tokens as cryptocurrency. On the other hand, you showed that you can issue bonds. Uh, how, as a startup founder, you decide what type of tokens you can issue? Like also. what factors come into play? Um, it totally depends. So. If we, I think we will see less and less utility tokens because utility tokens can be very good and they could appreciate a lot of value when the demand is very high and when there is a certain scarcity. Then it absolutely makes sense. But I think most of the tokens we will see in the future will be some kind of a debt or an equity instrument. I think, for example, um, I don't know, for example, real estate or uh, ship financing could be financed through debt or through equity. It's both possible. I think depending on what you want to uh, replicate, with a token, I think you can do some equity behavior or debt behavior. Okay, because uh, as I see, cryptocurrency is like a derivative, right? Tokens is like a derivative of a cryptocurrency. Pardon? Sorry. Tokens are like a derivative of cryptocurrency if you pay on a cryptocurrency. Maybe. A debt instrument. Derivatives. Derivatives. You could also, of course, uh, you could also uh, re re not replace. Um, replicate uh, derivatives. Uh, we, were, we were, for example, on the route of uh, finding out how it is to actually to build an option um, on, on a token. So it's absolutely possible, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. With all the tokens, the ICOs that are coming out, and many people believe that 90% or whatever are not quality or poor, mm -hmm. anybody can put out a white paper. Yeah. Shouldn't there be, and regulation is changing daily, System, like a Moody's or S&P? No. There be a or I don't think so because um, I, I, I think that you are, you, you, you are absolutely right. There has to be an independent institution. But the rating agencies are actually that ones who caused us the financial crisis. No, no, I agree on that. That's the problem. So, so in a good way, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But not, I think, in the way we <coughs> saw it like in 2006, 2007. And so it must be independent. The problem is um, with rating agencies. There are a lot of rating agencies, it depends, uh, where you can actually pay money and you get, to get their approval. And then there are other independent ones. For example, if you look at like real estate funds, for example, or um, other um, funds, mutual funds, um, there are like three or four big rating agencies, for example, in Germany. And some of them is only paid in 5,000. And then you will probably get the approval. And some of them are really independent. Ones that are not influenced by the 
business and paid mm -hmm. that caused the doctor to no, call in 99 and the financial yeah. crisis to be independent? Is this being discussed yeah. by Balfin and regulators or an independent? Uh, I, 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 I hope so. I really hope so because it, it absolutely makes sense. Uh, because what I know from uh, from the Bafin at the moment is that they are um, have now a workforce I think of 100 uh, people that are solely um, into cryptos and actually ICOs. So they are really I think f compared to other countries we are actually quite far already and uh, quite good. Um, but I don't know how it is with the rating agency currently. I don't know what the plan is there. But I, I would actually I would like it as long as it is really independent. Maybe they should rate through the blockchain. Yeah. Yes? So it works business model depends on accelerator program. Did so so far as our revenue model? Yes. Like uh, behind the accelerator program. Like yes. Uh, are you getting a share of the Yes, accelerator? exactly. So um, so nothing up front. So we are covering ICO related uh, costs and we are providing uh, seed funding. And in the end, we will receive between 3 and 10% of the tokens raised, depending on um, how big the ICO is. So we have like two determinants. One is like how big is the ICO and the other one is like um, how much cost do we have to cover because like structuring a security with a prospectus is much, much more expensive than for example a pure utility token where you can actually just go to the bathroom and ask, uh, are you sure we are not a security? They say yes and you can go ahead, more or less. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned before that you advise the startup to go to different uh, law companies or uh, legal advisors. Yeah, they different should. Countries. Yeah, they should. But No, we, we, we are covering. covering we are covering. I see already. Sorry, I see already. Cost. Maybe I should uh, define this. Is um, all the coding of the smart contract, but also all the legal teams, of course, okay. because other uh, players in the market. You are absolutely right. There, are other players in the market are actually working that way. They say, oh, we only take two or three percent or whatever of the tokens, and then actually they only connect them to legal teams, and then they have to pay 150, 200,000 euro, and then the startup is dead. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the point. Uh, yes, so, so um, two different stories, like we are, I think I'm not already allowed to disclose it, no, I don't think so, um, so, um, no, I just thought because I think we had like the, f no, we have to final call tomorrow, yeah, but okay, um, tomorrow I could uh, answer you more, but okay, in general, we are working together with, some, with someone who's doing a lot of marketing and every startup of, of us will get um, this package to do like very traditional digital marketing, which is actually not the best in the space. But we would promote every startup through our channels and of course to our investors will, because we are quite well connected to uh, big crypto investors as well. So um, yeah, we would advertise in them and of course our marketing director would always work together with their marketing director and also like our advisor who, for example, um, advised Demit or Sentiment to find out what is actually the best strategy to um, to engage the community because it's not all about money actually I mean so many ICOs it cost money. yeah it's really about engaging and making the people interested about you then it's automatic good I think yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Pre ICO is transfer initial now you often see this concept of the pre ICO and also see that in your presentation mm -hmm. pre ICO I don't understand that okay um, in general a pre ICO is actually to be very if I should be very precise, <coughs> you even have to differentiate. So there's a pre-ICO and there's a pre-contract. I will first come to the pre-ICO because I'm not the biggest fan of pre-contracts. Pre-ICO is actually you already know what token you will have as a startup. You already have the approval, it's coded, you can see it on GitHub. And actually the only thing is because you're an early investor and you have trust into the startup earlier, you will get a um, discount on it, like 20, 30%. Sometimes you see scams which do like 90%, but normally 20, 30, maybe 40%. And then there's a, was this uh, understandable? Yeah, but still, uh, I think it should be renamed then, because initial means initial. Yeah, okay, <laughs> now I got you. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 but <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good wording point. But, ac yeah. but also if you do, for example, an IPO, there would be people who already have like options to, um, to have some shares uh, 10 years before. So I think, yeah, but actually, yeah, if you take it word by word, it's actually correct. Mm -hmm. and not like because a lot of like ICOs should just die because at some point you just see the idea was that's interesting but not working yeah. because mm -hmm. of some technical constraints yes. mm -hmm. and then you should evaluate and then put more money in and not all the money up front 
Yeah, that, that's but that, that's all also also happening at the moment. That for example, the money raised, you have like a sec secondary offering or also a third offering, dependent if if only if certain milestones are reached. For example, I mean that's the beauty of this world that you can always, via smart contract, really connect it to uh, milestones. And I think that's a good concept. For example, the first million, okay, but now reach that milestone, then maybe second tranche, and then you could go ahead. And that's definitely a good model. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the second question. Of this. Mm -hmm. if you yeah, I like that model. How, how, would you, how would you connect smart contracts to milestones? It's quite easy because a lot, of, a lot of milestones are totally quantitative. For example, you could define certain KPIs. It's always very hard to measure quality. I mean, everyone is telling you that everyone could do it, but actually it's very hard to measure quality. But, but say, okay, a certain product milestone. Yeah, no, you, you need, uh, I don't know, let's say um, we want to at least reach 100 B2B customers until there. We want to have a um, marketing reach of 10,000 people and stuff like that, so quantitative stuff. And we want to have like, I don't know, cash in inflows of at least 100,000 euro. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that photo sharing is quite popular. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, sorry, I didn't understand the whole question, I'm sorry. So if I think if it's still a good idea? Yeah, so you mentioned that the use case for the blockchain in that space is that you don't take cost away from the creators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But are people, the creators, going to IAM because of the user base they have and that's what they're paying the fees for? I mean, of course, it's always, it's always um, the, a very big task to be the first mover and to get a certain audience because, I mean, you can be as, as cheap as you want if you, if you as an artist can only reach, so if the platform doesn't grow, you can only reach five people, of course, it's not worth it. But I mean, that's always, I think, that's what startup is about. You must be the first mover and you must scale it and as soon as you scale it, it's much, much superior compared to the traditional um, stock photos. Mm -hmm. and, and my second question yeah. was, you cap the initial ICO, so you say five million is what you guys are raising because that's what is enough for you to grow the product. Yes. So what happens if the business doesn't make any profit and it's losing money and it's running out of money? So if we are losing money, then the no, no, no. If, if the business, oh, our startups, yeah, oh. the startup burns through all the money and they have no. Cash uh, then. Then we would go uh, bankrupt because we are not taking any fixed fees. So we are always. We are always dependent that our startups succeed. If they succeed, we succeed. Um, and actually, it will be uh, it will happen the same as with every ICO that's next successful. So um, if they if they are not successful, if they go bankrupt, actually the token price will depreciate. Of course. Yeah, but most or the better ICOs rely solely for product and not business units. Okay, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about really cryptocurrencies and own protocols, yes, but always imagine that we're an accelerator and we normally take like real, uh, real world business solutions and uh, are tokenizing them. I think that's a little bit of a different story. You're totally right, I think, with uh, cryptocurrencies and if it's really a protocol that's like all over the world and like um, an open source environment, then you're right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think that's a different story. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. I mean, they added to the Ethereum recently, mm -hmm. the transactions. Do you think a little bit of due diligence will solve this problem? Yes. Yeah. I the think. Of privacy, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, it's for me personally, like I, I like, I really like the privacy of that space in general. Yeah. But I think if you really invest into companies and you want to do it uh, responsible, then a KYC is needed. So who's your who is actually the one who invests the money? Because it's a yeah, it's a very hard discussion. I think I think regulation will come in, and there will be KYC and um, ALM for. Uh, sorry, are the words actually clear for everyone? KYC and ALM. Yeah, yeah. know you know your customer and uh, and the money uh, laundering. Um, so I think there will be definitely regulation on that. And for example, um, we just um, had a call today with a yeah 
quite an innovative German bank to work, to work actually on an automated um, KYC process for the ICO space. Because in the end it will save also the investors. That's what I think. seen ICOs sell out in 10 minutes or one block mm -hmm. or people are paying absurdly high transaction fees mm -hmm. in order to purchase half mm -hmm. the ICO. Uh, are you looking at like alternate models, Dutch auctions? No, it, uh, it can't happen uh, with us yeah. because our token is actually the access. So if you, it's a pro rata base. So if you hold 1% of our token, you're only allowed to invest 1% into the token sale of the startup. So it can just, yeah, per definition, the maximum reach in the first stage could be only the 100 percent. And all of that's secured by KYC? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yes. You guys mentioned you do uh, a lot of security with purely light tokens. Are you also doing like investment minimum funds for your clients? Or um, how are you getting around like the... Um, um, you mean the costs associated with the KYC? Call it accredited um, investors or are you calling it non so so we, we, are still, we are still looking at both first, um, maybe I should clarify that, we are still looking at both utility and um, equity style tokens, definitely. Um, the only thing I said is I think we will see much more security tokens in the future and I personally like it because it provides, it really has an intrinsic value and provides a value add to the inv investor. <laughs> I think as, as soon as it really comes to, oh, if the KYC takes pl place as in the traditional space, I think then a lot of startups have to think about minimum investments. But for us, for example, at the moment, it's for our KYC, for example, it's not w you could still invest with one euro into us. Yeah, but that's not legal in most jurisdictions. Pardon? That's not legal in most jurisdictions. That's legal if you perform proper due. Uh, I mean, we, we are, for example, we are an access token, right? So we are not, not classified as a security. The one that you're offering. Yeah, the one I'm, we are offering is not a security. Okay, now I'm confused because you just said that most of them are securities globally. No, but most of the tokens in the future will for sure be securities. Sure. In general, that's what I think. Yeah. In, our, in our batch, you will see both. You will see securities and utility style tokens. Um, but they, they, are not, they are not coded yet because the batch will already, they will, uh, will start in February. And then in uh, May, there will be the pre-sale of the startups. And we, for example, we are a utility token because for us, it just makes sense sure, not to be a I'm security. Not talking about your token. I'm yeah. talking about the yeah. security tokens that you're yeah. offering. And security tokens is definitely something uh, that we have to look uh, I mean, I, I just said that we now uh, initiated talks uh, with banks who are very keen because the problem is most banks actually don't want to be in that ICO space. They just said, I don't want to have the money from the ICOs on my accounts. And actually, we are very happy that we found a bank who says, oh, we would love to build a venture with you to find the KYC and uh, LM process for that. But uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not familiar with all the other regulations connected to it. Yeah, so like when you offer securities, you actually, it's not where you're located that matters, it's where the buyer is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's many security regulations across the world that are yes. very different. Yes, and especially in Europe have the big problem that it e even that it is even not the same for every country. So in yeah. Germany, for example. So like you guys offer prospectuses? Uh, prospectuses, I mean, it always, it always depends what the regulator really says. I, I personally think um, that equity tokens will be treated as an equity investment. So I think uh, prospectus will come. If it's about equity, I just hope that the threshold until what you don't have to release a, a prospectus will hopefully be at 8 million euro because there's like a no, uh, you are, I'm very sure you are familiar with that, but um, uh, the, the threshold changed. So uh, until now it was like the threshold in, in, the, in Europe for releasing a, not to release a prospectus was 100,000 to 5 million. Germany 100,000, Luxembourg 5 million. And now it changes to 1 million to 8 million. Actually what we also propose with the German Blockchain Association is that the threshold, the maximum threshold of 8 million should actually count for ICOs. That would mean that every startup actually, even though issuing a security, but would uh, raise less than 8 million euro, doesn't have to issue a prospectus. So another reason to release the 8 million euro range? Yeah, that would be another argument to, um, yeah, to raise not too much money. Mm -hmm. I cannot. So if 
I actually think that one one trillion I cannot. And don't you think that that's actually you know like in the this decentralization of between entrepreneurs and people investing, if you actually come up with an idea, for example, for free energy, mm -hmm. you cannot. Why should you not? No, no, I think I think that's a quite a similar to the question he asked. I think if we are really looking at like new protocols, new blockchain protocols that are all around the world and where like an own cryptocurrency is actually created, then it's a totally different case because the cryptocurrency is also treated very different. You can still go for a foundation in Switzerland and raise two billion euro. Yeah. So yeah. Switzerland is winning in crypto. In crypto, <laughs> they, they have a, at least at least. <laughs> So first, this is not fair because I know this presentation. I know it's Andres. I was in this room. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, I, I call Nicola. Okay. So I will make just the same question that I made to him. How does it feel to be in the position where actually it's all about decentralizing? You know, you know, it's all about killing the middleman. Yeah. How does it feel to be actually the middleman mm -hmm. between? You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. It's absolutely right. Yeah. No, um, it's it's 100% uh, right, and you see that very very often. The 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 other question is um, what? Maybe to, to ask you a question. What what would be your alternative? That it no, 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 that no, it continues like this? I, 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 I need to thank you because mm -hmm. so I'm an entrepreneur and I'm an investor. Mm -hmm. So actually I'm the both. Yeah. I, I understand the needs of having a company. Yeah. I understand the yeah. mm -hmm. this middle yeah. that actually, and this is the trick here. You are not making money, you know, by selling the service. Mm -hmm. You are actually, you know becoming part of the product, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, yeah. you know, you will take no, you know, entry fee, mm -hmm. you, know, you actually take percentage of the token, so yeah. you are actually just making a selection and believing in the yeah. idea, so you are actually doing, it's like you are a VC for the new paradigm of decentralization, Yes. you know, on the other side, you know, I also understand that then you run into this, you know, game cat, you know, red cat thing that you actually need to win to. You know, so you mm. become part of the interested that the actually the, the startup win. Mm. And that's the other question that I have, you know, that that, that I need to send is that it's like the idea is to get as pre-sale as you want because that saves the people, that secures the people. You know, if you manage to have like one million on pre-sale, it means that even before going to market, that's actually what an IPO also means, mm. you have already like a stable investment yeah. that's already investing the seed, so the it's a secure investment. Mm. But this, you know, on the other side, as an investor, I know that if this shit happens, yeah. they will dump yeah. because we'll give them 50% discount. Yeah. So it's not a fair deal. I, I'm That's also. The, like, I'm how you manage this, mm. you know? I'm also, I'm also not a big fan of big discounts. I think that there must be an incentive for the early adopters. So I think a 20%, yeah, it always depends because for example, um, I mean a lot of those um, startups, for example, don't have a prototype. And then for example, if you do a pre-sale and then actually your prototype doesn't even work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Back in the days it was like that. Yeah. You know, like no, but, but I still think there must, be, there must be an incentive for early investors. Yeah. And I think the only, I think it's not responsible at all. I've seen now a lot of ICOs which actually give like 80% discount in the first week, then 70% uh, then, 40 60, 50, 40, 30. Yeah. That's, uh, no, we will go for maximum 25% uh, discount well, or something. Brother, if I, you know, decide to submit to Iconic Lab my ideas, you know, you give me like that, that you, you have like a, a max percentage on the pre-sale. Yes. The discount that you can give because in the end that's, that's actually yeah. the first business that we do between yeah. us. And the other sense, you put the limit to reality, and that's I also like. Meaning yeah. that when you have too much money, you become lazy. Yeah. Now it's even worse. You have too much money. There is nothing that I can do that gives me the re the, the ROI <laughs> of Bitcoin raising value. Yes. Ethereum, you know? so why should I actually do something? Yeah. Right. So you Especially with you IOTA now. You do, you actually, your job is to do this balance. Yes. To actually yeah. create value on the yeah. idea in order to become actually a real product. Yes. And I like, uh, I think I mentioned that before, but I also really like the idea of really providing cash flows um, to the investors. So for example, what Token as a Service does as well as a fund, they, they provide you every quarter, for example, with a cash flow. That's what I really like because this really gives tokens an intrinsic value. Or if you have to, for example, a buyback um, option or something. Okay, thank you for so many questions. Thank you. Yeah.